Here's a tough but unfortunately common situation to deal with. Starting a femoral central line on a patient that's pulseless or so hypotensive that you can't feel femoral pulse. It takes away one of your common landmarks for a femoral central line, but here's how I deal with it. So no matter how big or small your patient's lower body area is, the femoral vein's always going to be in the same orientation with respect to the bony landmarks of the pelvis. So let's use that to our advantage. Now as you guys know, the inguinal ligament runs from the pubic tubercle to the anterior superior iliac spine laterally. Now if you take the distance upon which the inguinal ligament lies and divide that distance into thirds, the femoral vein runs under the inguinal ligament about a third of the distance of the ligament away from the lateral side of the pubic tubercle. So here's a quick way to reproduce that measurement uh, to put in a central line. Take your hand and arrange it in almost an L shape like this and take the tip of your index finger and place it on the patient's anterior superior iliac spine. Then take the thumb of the same hand and place it on the lateral side of the pubic tubercle. The line from the tip of your thumb to the tip of your index finger should be running exactly along the inguinal ligament. If you drew a line from your thumb crease in your hand to the inguinal ligament, that measurement is almost exactly one-third the distance of the inguinal ligament. Now all you have to do is lie the syringe in the thumb crease of your hand, enter the skin with the tip of your needle right where those two lines intersect. Directly underneath that intersection lies the femoral vein. To help wrap things up here, including some pitfalls to avoid with central line placement, so these are some you know rookie mistakes that you'll want to avoid. These are mistakes that I'm still making today, but uh, if you're going to take anything home, you haven't been paying attention at all, try to take these uh, final points home with you. Number one on the list, don't forget the flush. You have to do it before you get all sterile. There's nothing worse than getting gloved and gowned up and realizing you have to start over because you didn't put any flush in your kit or in a sterile basin. Don't forget the flush. You got to make sure your guide wire is ready to use. Uh, you got to make sure that J loop and that tip of that wire is hidden by that conical plastic piece. And you got to make sure you understand how the wire is to be fed, whether it's going to be one of those ones you can feed with your thumb, or if you actually need an exposed piece of wire to grab between your index finger and your thumb to advance it through the needle. On that same note, you got to have your guide wire on your sterile field within an arm's reach of wherever you're doing your procedure. You don't want to have to you know, turn around and grab it off the table or have someone hand it to you. This is a moment where you should be as still as possible and you shouldn't have to move too much to grab your guide wire. Remember, there are certain patients that should just not be receiving a triple lumen catheter. These are people that may need a large amount of volume infused in a short period of time. People like your trauma patients, your burns, GI bleeders, or anybody that's coding. Instead of placing triple lumen catheters in these people, you should be putting cordis catheters, which you can float a triple lumen through, or a trauma one. If you're placing a cordis catheter, no matter how emergent it is, or no matter how quick the line needs to be put in, you got to take a couple seconds before you start to make sure that dilator is within the center of the cordis catheter and that it's snapped in place. You don't want to have the guide wire in the patient and you have to take both hands off of it to assemble your cordis catheter before you can place it in.